All right, so last week we started a new series. We're calling it Discovering Joy. And, um, you know, with all the things going on in our society, joy is a good thing, and we could use more of it. And last week, I wasn't here, but through video, I encourage you to seriously consider how's your joy factor? How, how much joy do you have in your life? And is there some way or sometimes when we could use an extra dose of joy? And so uh, we studied Acts chapter 16 last week, and that is uh, a picture of the Apostle Paul in the, in the town of Philippi, um, and he shows up, and in a relatively short period of time, he gets himself thrown in jail. And even in that situation of being thrown in jail, beaten with rods, uh, all the accusations that were against him, he, he and Silas still had this sense of joy in jail. And so that was our challenge to increase our joy. So are you ready to discover some joy? Because we are going to go to Philippians chapter 1. Um, and we're going to be studying our way through Philippians, looking for the theme of joy. And I decided to cover the subject of joy because uh, I had a discussion with the elders and I was asking them, okay, so guys, like what, what project or what, what aspect of JBF could we be working on right now um, that, would, that would push us forward as a whole church? And there was a, a number of ideas that got thrown out. But the number one concept that we all agreed on was that our, we, we could use some joy. Uh, not only because of everything that's happening in our society, but <clears throat> I think what happens sometimes to us as Christians is that we become so serious about trying to follow Jesus that we become kind of stern people. You know what I mean? Where we, we lose the sense of the freedom and the joy of being in the presence of Christ. And so we, we want to recapture that. And people have noticed that in my preaching, I don't do a lot of book studies. Uh, at least I haven't here. Now, typically what I did when I was, I've been a pastor for 22 years, and uh, during that time, I intentionally went back and forth between teaching on a subject and then teaching on a book. Uh, and I did that intentionally because I think that what can happen in your preaching is that uh, there's certain themes and thoughts that can happen in a pastor's life or in a church's life where they become so focused on a certain theme that they get out of balance. In this particular situation, being an interim pastor, my job is to make some adjustments to the overall culture of a church and then have your next pastor come in and, and take over. And so in a relatively short period of time, I want to address a number of key cultural things about a church. Uh, so I've stayed fairly thematic. Now, we're going to be studying the book of Philippians. And so we're studying a book, and yet I'm focused on one particular theme in Philippians, which means that we're going to skip over some areas as far as we're not going to spend a lot of time in some areas where normally I would slow down and, and we would go sentence by sentence, maybe even phrase by phrase. There's going to be sections where I'm going to kind of move pretty quickly um, because we're primarily looking at the book of Philippians as a place to discover joy. All right, so we are in Philippians chapter one. Let's start reading. It says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and the deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all of my prayers for you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, 
since I have you in my heart, and whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Christ Jesus to the glory and praise of God. Okay, so those are quite a few verses. I want to go back and kind of work our way back through them. Um, The Apostle Paul basically starts his letters the same way. Now, uh, let me just first say, the book of Philippians is a letter. It's a letter written by a missionary to a supporting church. So, we, we have various missionaries that we support, and we get updates from our missionaries telling us how it's going, right? So that's what Philippians is all about. It's the Apostle Paul writing back to a supporting church. The the people in Philippi were financially supporting him, and he's one of their missionaries. And so he's writing a, a, a letter back to them saying, here's how it's going, and he's filling them in. And so he introduces himself, kind of like he always does, and and wishes them well, kind of like he always does. And then in verse 3 is where he starts really giving some detail. And in verse 3, he starts talking about them being faithful partners. He he says, you know, you guys have been great. You, You guys have been so supportive. Thank you for being a supporting church. And and he's he talks about he uses the word joy right at the tail end of verse 4. And he's like, I always pray with joy for you. There's this sense of yes inside of him because of them. They've been faithful partners. They've been, they've been helpful. And, and he has this prayer for them that, that uh, is, is beckoning them on. Before we go into those verses, I, I want to stop and just make a really important statement. And this statement is true not only for this message, but for all the messages that we're going to cover in this series. And that statement is that this series is not about achieving joy. This series is about receiving joy. I I want to make this really clear. There's this thing that we do where we say to ourselves, if I work real hard, I can be a joyful person. No, you can't. Because joy is a gift from God. You cannot achieve joy. That's that's not our job. Our job is to be connected to God, connected to the Holy Spirit, so that His joy flows through us. So here's what happens when we try to achieve joy. We get that whole stern thing going, like, I am going to be joyful. Right? And it destroys the whole thing that we're trying to do. But when we're opening ourselves and trusting God to make us joyful, then then it's this whole thing of God, If you don't do it, it's not going to happen. And I'm opening up to you. Do that inside of me. So let me just remind you of of a past sermon. There was this crazy man who came up here with two trees and a chainsaw. Do you remember this? And and there was the, the human spirit tree, and it had all the sinful things on it. And then there was the Holy Spirit tree, and it had love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self control, all those things on it. And we we said, you know. Here's the deal. In my human spirit, I am all these things. And only the Holy Spirit in me is love, joy, peace. And my my goal is to connect to this tree and eliminate that tree the best I can. Okay? And so I want to remind you that this is not about achieving. If I'm trying to achieve it, I'm over here. 
if I'm receiving it, it's I'm opening up to the Holy Spirit over here. Does that make sense? Okay, so it's not about achieving, it's about receiving. And as I was diving into this subject, one of the, one of the questions that I've been wrestling with and, and what I challenged you to think about last week was, am I a joyful person? Am I a person that has that kind of positive, joyous, enthusiastic kind of thing? Or, or am I grumpy? And, and I've been watching myself, and I, I, I wish I was more joyful. Uh, there's these, these things that happen that I get frustrated with, and boom, the and, and again, it's not about me trying to force myself to be joyful. It's about, am I opening up to the Holy Spirit in everyday life and letting His joy flow inside of me? And so it's an attitude of openness to the Holy Spirit. And so I'm up here teaching about this, but I want to make it absolutely clear that I'm also a student. I am learning about the concept of joy, and it has been fascinating. And so in my personal quiet time, I, I'm coming to God, and I'm going like, okay, God, unleash this thing inside. I, I would like more joy. Come on, let's do this. Let's, let's have this interaction about what joy is all about and how I can live in, in better contact with you uh, in, in my research, I ran across this quote. It's by Robert Rainey. He was a Scottish pastor and the, the principal of New College in Edinburgh. He's quoted as saying this, Joy is the flag which is flown from the castle of the heart when the king is in residence there. Isn't that a great quote? Joy is the flag that flies over the castle of the heart when the king is in residence there. And so, I think in my life, I'm going like, how often is the king in residence? And how much of the time am, am I ignoring him or, you know, pushing him out? doing my own thing. Well, the Apostle Paul is, has this theme of joy happening in the book of Philippians. And he's, he's saying that he has the right to feel joyful and thankful about this church. He, he literally says in verses 7 and 8, I have the right to feel joyful about you. <laughs> Which is... Kind of humorous to me. Uh, and then in verses 9 through 11, he, he, he does this prayer. He's like, when I'm praying for you, the reason that, that I have joy is that you've been, you've been faithful in helping me. But I'm also joyful because I have this thing where I believe that God is working inside of you to transform you. He's doing something inside of you that's going to make you complete. And, and I'm praying for that. And in verses 1 through 11, just as you read through these verses, can you hear the energy behind what he's talking about? This guy is upbeat, and, and this, is, this is a very positive letter. And so I'm thinking to myself, you know, things must be going really well for the Apostle Paul right now. Things, he, he's got this energy. It's like, yeah, things must be going really well. So let's, let's pack it up at verse 12. He says, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it's become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Well, wait a minute. He's again. Because <laughs> when he was at Philippi, he was in jail overnight. But this time, this is a long-term jail thing. He's, he's stuck in jail. And he's, 
He's all upbeat. And I want to give you kind of this picture of what a Roman jail is like, okay? So I I have this picture that uh, I'm going to have put up on the screen. So this is an actual Roman jail. You'll see that there's like a, a Christian altar on the left side. This jail is where the Apostle Peter spent time. The reason that the cross is upside down is because Peter was crucified upside down. And so they, to represent that, they put the cross upside down. So this started as a water cistern. So think of digging down, lining it with rocks and sealing it and pouring water in there and keeping water in there. That's what it was. And eventually they converted it to a jail. So this is literally a hole in the ground with a roof over the top and a single hole. If you were put in jail, they lowered you through the hole. If, uh, by the way, the bathroom facilities, uh, drinking water provided, no. (laughs) If, If you didn't have someone on the outside who was giving you food, you died. There you go, Roman jail. And that's the kind of thing that Paul lived in. Now, there was a second option. If you had the money, you could pay for a Roman soldier to be chained to you and you could be in house arrest. And we don't know for sure whether the Apostle Paul was in something like this, or if he was in house arrest, although he seems to indicate that that he's chained to a Roman guard right now. Says, I'm in chains. It It could be a reference to being in jail. It could be a reference to actually being in chains and in house arrest. Um... Most scholars believe that he was in house arrest for a couple reasons. First of all, the Philippians had sent him some money. um, And his reference to the whole palace guard has become aware of the fact that I'm in chains. Now, you do know what he means by that, right? I, I mentioned this before. It meant that these poor Roman soldiers were prisoners of the Apostle Paul. They were stuck chained to him. Can you imagine the uh, intense torture of being a pagan Roman soldier connected to the passionate Apostle Paul? Those poor Roman soldiers. I'm betting they rotated everybody. Nobody wanted to be chained to this dude. But when you're, you're chained to him, you're chained to him 24 hours a day. And, and so now, he's had the opportunity to witness to the whole palace guard because nobody wants to be chained to this guy. And so he's like, this is an, an advantage. I have infiltrated the highest levels of the Roman guard and I'm, I'm actually infiltrating into the Roman government the gospel of Jesus Christ. And because of that, he has joy. So, uh, now, we're going to, let's, let's go on to these next verses, starting at verse 14. He says, And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The most important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. So he's back, he's back to joy again. And he's, he's saying, there's, here's what's happened, is that because I'm in chains, there's some people that saw how bold I was, and they're trying to mimic me. They're, they're, 
they're bold. They're out there witnessing too. And, and I've inspired them apparently to, to really go after sharing Jesus with people. And there's some other people who, who actually see this as an advantage. I, I'm in jail. They're trying to keep me in jail and they're trying to become more important in the church. And so they're witnessing as a way to like be, be number one, be, you know, win more people than me and you know, be super cool and influential in the church. And so they, they see witnessing as a competition. I don't care. It doesn't matter as long as Jesus gets preached. Now, I have had an experience where people were in competition with me and they used lies and they used manipulation as a way to make me look bad. And I will tell you, it was not a joyful time in my life. I did not rejoice. I was frustrated. And yet, the Apostle Paul somehow manages to keep an attitude of joy through all of this, despite people who are supposed to be on his side literally doing things to keep him from getting out of jail. I, I don't know about you, but I, I think I would find that frustrating and difficult to take. But for him, it's a point of joy. And as I read this section and as I think about this, one of the things that I realized is that really joy is about seeing things from God's perspective. When, when I can view life and view the difficulties or the situations of life in the same way that God does, I open up my mind and my heart to joy. When I view it from a selfish angle, when I view it from a purely human standpoint, boy, that's when joy falls apart. That's, that's when I... I lose perspective and I lose connection. And so, just walking through life, doing everyday things with a God perspective helps me stay in joy. So, we're going to keep on going. We're, we picked it, or we dropped it kind of uh, halfway through verse 18. There's that last sentence in. Verse 18, it says, Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet, what should I choose? I don't know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. And convinced of this, I know that I will remain and will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. So that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you, this is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also suffer for him, since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. So the Apostle Paul, he, he again, he's, he's doing this joyful thing and he's optimistic and cheerful. And I, there's that one section of verses that just amazes me. He, uh, he says, for to, 
To me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if, if I was to put it my own way, I, he's, he's like, if I live, I get to live for Jesus. If I die, I get to live with Jesus. And that's, that's his perspective. I, I'm either living for him or with him. Now, living with him is better. Uh, I, I can't wait to live with him, but living for him is good too. And because you need me to live for him, all right, I'll stay. You know, isn't it just, it's just really interesting perspective that he has. And if we, if we can take on a perspective that it's all about Jesus and that being connected with him and living for him is the source of our joy, that, that just makes life so much better. And then starting in verse 27, he, he tells them, whatever you do, conduct your lives in a way that's worthy of, of what it looks like to follow Jesus. You, you have this good news, the gospel. The word gospel means good news. So you have this good news, like live like it's good news. Live that way. And, and then he says something that I find disturbing. It's in verses 29 and 30. I don't like these verses. I suspect you won't either. He says, For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also suffer for him. What? Do, do you understand what he's saying there? You, you are so fortunate because you have the gospel and you get to suffer. Isn't that awesome? And the answer is no. And yet for him, it's yes. I'm not into pain. I'm just... I make myself exercise because I don't like pain. I just, I avoid pain. And when I have pain, I take a pill to make the pain go away. And he's like, you are so lucky. You guys in Philippi, I know it's difficult. You're so lucky. <laughs> you get to suffer. Like, what? What's, what's with that? And so I want to just stop and just talk about that for just a little bit because this is really important. Suffering is important for us. The first reason that suffering is important is suffering proves that God loves me. Yep. Suffering proves that God loves me. And so I'm going to bring in some verses outside of Philippians here. Uh, Hebrews 12, verses 7 and 8 say this, Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate true sons and daughters at all. Suffering proves that we are Jesus' children. If he didn't love us, he wouldn't work with us to make us the best we could be. That's not it. Suffering also proves, or also brings me blessings. That going through suffering is the process of being blessed. And this is what Jesus says in Matthew 5, 11, and 12. It said, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil things against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So, blessings, that comes through suffering. No suffering, no blessings. God's trying to bless us. And so that's why the Apostle Paul is, is saying that. But suffering not only brings me, shows that God loves me, 
and that he's bringing me blessing, but suffering also leads to holiness. Suffering is God's way of cleaning us up. All of God's discipleship classes are held at the School of Hard Knocks. All of God's discipleship classes are held at the School of Hard Knocks. And here's the verse that talks about that. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 and 2 says this, Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves with the same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for uh, evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. It is God's way of purifying us. He does it on purpose. And so, because of these verses, I came to a biblical principle uh, that I think is true and I'm thinking about this, and I'm going to share it with you, and you think about this. The biblical principle is, happiness is the enemy of joy. When I live a happy, fun life, it distracts me from God's joy. And until I learn to really be connected with the Spirit of God and filled with His Spirit and the joy that results, I will always use happiness as a substitute for joy. And let's face it, we live in a world that is really focused on happiness and and we have the finances to pull it off. And because we become so distracted with all kinds of wonderful trinkets and toys and things to do and places to be, we, we don't really look for a life of joy. We don't need it. We have happiness. So here's, here's some of the things that I've learned about joy in this section. I, I've learned that I can't achieve joy, that I have to receive joy. And that receiving joy only comes through a connection with the Holy Spirit. I, I've realized that I have to become open to joy when things are difficult, that I have to get, get out of my own selfish happiness and instead understand that when, when times are difficult, it isn't that God doesn't love me or that He's angry with me or that he's he's mean he's actually treating me like a child and discipline me disciplining me and growing me and that i've learned that happiness tends to distract me from joy and so this week i i'm leaving you with a challenge and here's the challenge when when things get tough When you're frustrated, stop and just go like, okay, am I going to choose happiness or am I going to choose joy? Am I going to go through this knowing that, yep, it's hard, and yes, I'm not happy, but it is the pathway to joy, and I'm opening up to letting God do this in me to bless me, to treat me as his child, and to guide me into a life of righteousness. I'm going to give you a minute to just close your eyes and talk to God about these things in your own life, and then I'll close this with prayer.